This is on? Oh. Oh, oh, we're on. Oh, we're on. We're on something. What are you on? All right. <laughs> You're on something. You're on to something. All right. How are you all doing tonight? Did you all get a nice little snack? Good. Good, good. Thank you, whoever cooked that up. Trish, thank you very much. They all, they all look very, very happy today. No napping now um, after dinner. So, Hey, um, I just want to let you guys know kind of a cool thing. We, um, we got ourselves back on the radio. And, uh, yeah, so it's a station out of McMinnville, but, gosh, I, I was able to get it here in town the other day, so you might be able to get it. If not, you can get it online. Is that correct, Glenn? KKJC.net. If you guys, uh, we got two slots Monday through Friday, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, we're right before Pastor Chuck, so 5.30 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. So if you guys want to tune in to... And some people are getting up for work and stuff, and that, so that's a good thing. But uh, they're going to, what are we going through? We're doing the Revelation series. We just started that, so we'll be doing that for quite a while. So 96.3 FM Christian Radio, McMinnville, Oregon. So awesome. Good to be with you all tonight. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we want to give you thanks this evening for every single person that's here. Lord, for your abundant blessings in our lives. And Father, it was so awesome to be able to spend that time just sitting before you in prayer tonight. And I want to thank you for that and bringing the people out for that, Lord. Because we do believe with all of our hearts, God, that prayer changes things. We believe that it's very powerful. And, and, and we believe that when we pray to you, you hear us. And because you are the almighty God, we can put our full trust in you. And tonight, once again, Lord, as we approach you, we do the same. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts this evening. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be our teacher tonight, that you would open up our hearts. Lord, that you would allow us to and help us to glean things from these scriptures that are important for our daily lives. So go before us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so 2 Samuel 15. And I'm just going to start reading down through here. I've got a little bit different version here tonight. I've got the uh, Charles uh, Spurgeon Bible here, and it's a little bit different than New King James, but I'm sure you'll be able to follow along good. It's kind of a refreshing uh, version. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start reading down through here, and we'll just see where we go. Verse, chapter, first, chapter 15, verse 1. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot, horses, and fifty men to run before him. He would get up early, and he would stand beside the road leading to the city gate. And whenever anyone had a grievance to bring before the king for settlement, Absalom called out to him and asked, What city are you from? If he replied, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel, Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are good and right, but the king does not have anyone to listen to you. He added, If only someone would appoint me judge in the land, then anyone who had a grievance or dispute could come to me, and I'd make sure he received justice. When a person approached to pay homage to him, Absalom reached out his hand and took hold of him and kissed him. Absalom did this according to uh, Absalom did this to all the Israelites who came to the king for a settlement. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So now you might remember that Absalom was in exile for killing um, Amnon because Amnon raped his half sister. Absalom thought it was his duty to avenge her. 
And so he did by taking his life. And so for about five years, I think we saw last week, Absalom was not seen in Jerusalem. He was dwelling in a whole different part of Israel. He was hiding out, if you will. Um, He was seeking refuge. And, you know, the deal was that if he would just stay where he is and stay away from the king, that he would allow him to go ahead and just live his life. But then after many, many years, we found that David's heart began to soften towards Absalom, and he began to long for his son, Absalom. Remember about this fellow now. He's head and shoulders above the rest. He's very tall. He's very handsome. How many pounds did his hair weigh every year when he cut it? Five pounds! Once a year haircut, and he'd get five pounds of hair off that head of his. So this guy had quite the, quite the do, I suppose. And uh, I would assume that he just kind of let it blow in the wind so that everybody could see it. <laughs> so anyway, so Absalom's kind of been in exile for a while, and now the king has decided to allow him back into town. And, you know, we talked about Absalom the other, the other time, last time we were together, and we, we understand that Absalom, what he's doing here, is doing exactly what Satan does. He's doing the bidding of the evil one. He looks really good on the outside. He seems like he's got his act together. I guess he's got a knack with people. He's got a gift of gab, I suppose. And people are naturally attracted to him. Which, when you look at all of that, gosh, you know the same thing can be said for some of the temptations that we go through with the enemy. Or some of the things that are going on out in the world today. You know, a lot of it looks good. A lot of it seems to make sense. And there's a lot of Absalom running around out there today in our culture. And what we're going to see him do is exactly the same thing that Satan's been doing throughout all of history. Um, And we did mention that um, the tactics, the tactics that our adversary uses against us are very limited and controlled by God. He doesn't have absolute free reign over our lives or anybody else's lives for that matter. And I'm really glad that God put a leash on him, right? Because without that leash, then God only knows what types of uh, deceptions that he could come up with. But we found there were three main tools that Satan uses in our lives. And uh, uh, Eve experienced it in the garden at the tree. Jesus experienced the same three when he was in the wilderness being tempted. And John tells us in his letter, 1 John, that these three tactics are the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So every time you see these temptations like Adam and Eve in the garden, Jesus in the wilderness, um, any Christians throughout history, any of that, um, you'll find the very, very same tactics are used. He even used those same tactics against Jesus himself. Now, the difference between what happened with Jesus and what happened with Eve was Jesus knew God's word because he was God and it was his word. Eve didn't. Eve did not have God's word to defend against the attack of Satan at that tree that day. Of course, a lot of people are going to argue and say, do you think it really was a tree? Couldn't it have been something? You know what? It says a tree And who cares? We go with the tree. Okay? The outcome is the same. Right? So the first thing he comes to her with is, that tree really looks good for food. That's the first thing he said to her. She looked at it and she goes, ooh, that's pretty yummy looking fruit on there, right? And then he tells her that it would make you wise. And then he tells her that it would make you like God. And so, based upon those three things, Eve is defeated. Now, she didn't even have God's protective words figured out yet. 
Because when he came to her, he said, hey, you can't eat of any tree. She goes, well, we can eat any tree we want, except for that one over there. And she said, uh, God said, if we, if, we, uh, if we look at it, or if we eat it, we'll die. Well, that's not what God said. He didn't say anything about looking at it. <coughs> he did say, if you take from it and eat from it, you'll surely die. So Eve, in her effort to have a defense against this temptation, she did not understand God's plan. She did not understand God's will or his strategy. And it's unfortunate for Eve because she's taken a pretty bad rap all the way down through history. A lot of you gals have borne the brunt of that throughout history. <laughs> right? Well, I'm serious now. I mean, there are cultures out there um, say, in some of the other religions, such as Islam, where they would view women as lesser than human. They're the deceivers. They're the ones that took man down, in a sense. That's why you see them walking around all covered up like that, because they've been, they've been blamed and disrespected and falsely convicted, um, for being less than just a regular person. So they can't hold office. Some of the worst of the worst situations, you know, you hear it on the news. They can't go to school. They can't go shopping. They can't get a driver's license. They're pretty much like having a mule or a goat. That's how they're viewed as property. Um, that's been going on for thousands of years. It's still going on today. But when I look at that situation, I think to myself, well, you know, God had told us in his word that you men were supposed to be the head of your family. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be Christ in the relationship of your marriage. And your wife is supposed to be the bride, even as Christ is the head and she is the bride. That's the way God ordained things to be structured. And they're still structured the same way today. So why is it that Eve had such a problem deal dealing with this temptation she had? I think I have to ask the question, where was Adam? He's not there. Was he fishing? Hunting? What was he doing? He was somewhere other than where he was supposed to be, wasn't he? His job was to protect her. His job was to be a covering over her. And he failed. Now, what would have happened if he would have been standing there at the tree with her when the serpent came? You see, I don't think the serpent would have come. I think the serpent was waiting for that opportune time when she was alone without her covering without her protector, and she was vulnerable. And as sure as the day is long, she fell right into it. Now Jesus, on the other hand, handled that a lot differently, didn't he? Every time the enemy came to him in the wilderness, how did he respond to Satan? Scripture. Scripture the Word of God. Something that poor little Eve didn't quite have figured out yet. Maybe that was partly Adam's fault. Maybe he should have been teaching her, you know, whatever. But she didn't have the right tools to do that kind of battle. Same thing applies today. When you're lusting in the eyes and the flesh and the pride of life comes along, let me tell you something, your willpower ain't going to get you through it. Uh, the fact that you know right from wrong is not going to get you through it. You need God's will. You need God's word. You need God's power to be able to bring you through those times of temptation. Because Absalom is everywhere. He's in every church. Churches are full of Absaloms out there. And we're going to see, well, we've seen already in chapter 15, just what kind of guy he is. His dad lets him come back, gives him some uh, comfort and some authority, and what does Absalom do? Well, he goes completely behind David's back, his father. And so, here I go again. Where was David at during all this? Where was David at when he should have been raising this young man in the ways of the Lord? 
Where was David? He was on the battlefield, fighting wars. He was accumulating women. He was dealing with his own sin. He wasn't a very good dad, not a very good father, when you look at the record that we have concerning him. So Absalom grew up in a family that was absolutely, totally dysfunctional, right? With all the power that you can possibly imagine now, David is the king of Israel. David possesses all the wealth, all the power, all the authority, all the greatness of being a great warrior and being the king of Israel and Judah. The whole kit and caboodle. And here's Absalom, his son, growing up in this environment, probably feeling just a little bit entitled as he grows up. That throne one day is going to be mine. Well, it didn't turn out that way, did it? It was given to Solomon. So you got to wonder, okay, now wait a minute, how's Absalom feeling about all this and what's going on with him? Well, he kills his brother. Um, he gets sent away. Now he comes back and this guy jumps right in to his agenda when he gets there. And the first thing he does is he gets chariots, horses, and 50 men to run in front of him. Now, when you look at that, man, is that a pride gig or what going on there, right? I am the king's son. I'm going to get the nicest chariot. It's going to have like mag wheels and headers and running lights and, you know, the greatest animals to pull it. And, you know, and not only that, I'm going to get these guys, these soldiers to run in front of me just to show everybody how great I am. Well, that's what he did. He rode all over town like that. And, you know, his hair's flying in the wind. And people are going, hey, Absalom, nice chariot, you know. Well, that's bad enough as it is. But he had a reason for doing it this way. So he would go early in the morning, it tells us, to the gate. Now, the gate of the city was a very special place. That's where a lot of court issues were settled, treaties were settled, marriage agreements were settled, land disputes were settled, and the wise men would gather the elders at the gates, and then they would come in and they would deal with some of the issues. Ultimately, if it was something they couldn't deal with, it would go to the king, and then the king would, would deal with it. So Absalom has a, a strategy here. He's going to start hitting on the people. He's going to start making himself known a little bit more to them in a new way as their leader. As the good shepherd. Because my father doesn't always have time for you folks, but I'll be here every morning for you. Any kind of problem you have, just come to the gate in the morning and I'll get it dealt with for you. Okay? I've got my chariot my horses and now i've got authority and absalom is saying to the people your claims are valid but my dad doesn't have time for you that doesn't sound too good does it that'd be kind of like you know someone coming to you and saying yeah your requests are valid you guys but you know what jesus is too busy to listen to you he don't have time for you so listen to me instead that's exactly what he's doing. He's turning the hearts of the people from the king to himself. Verse 4 says, If anyone would appoint me to be the judge in the land, well, now is it up to the people to appoint him to be judge in the land? Or would it be up to the king? So once again, right away, Absalom is usurping. He's lying. He's deceiving. He's pushing the authority that his father has off to the side, and he's saying, if the public were to bring me up, if the public were to worship me, if the public were to demand, then I could be their leader. You could appoint me to be the judge. And any time you got a problem, I will be fair. <coughs> really sounds familiar. It's kind of the same sales pitches we get today, right? If you'll elect me, I'll do this, and I'll do that. And it's all a big, fat lie, because I'm not going to do any of it. Right? If anything, we'll do the opposite. 
Things don't change much through history, you guys. Man's evil, sinful nature is the same. Yesterday, today, and basically forever. So if someone would appoint me to be the boss, man, I could sure make things easier on y'all. I'd make sure you all get justice. And not only that, if you come to see me, I'm not just going to shake your hand, but I'm going to kiss you. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to let you know that I really do care about you. Now, my father's up in his castle up there, his house up there, in his palace or whatever. He doesn't care about you guys, but I do. So, what winds up happening? Absalom did this, and it says at the end of verse 6 that he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He turned them against his own father. Now, this went on for four long years. Verse 7, when four years had passed, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron to fulfill a vow I made to the Lord. For your servant made a vow when I lived in Geshur of Aram, saying, If the Lord really brings me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. Go in peace, the king said. And so he went to Hebron. When Abs then Absalom sent agents throughout the tribes of Israel with this message. When you hear the sound of the ram's horn, you are to say, Absalom has become the king in Hebron. So 200 men from Jerusalem went with him, Absalom. They were invited. And they were going innocently, for they did not know the whole situation. And while he was offering the sacrifice, Absalom sent for David's advisor, Ahithophel, the Gilanite, from the city of Gilo. And so the conspiracy grew strong, and the people supporting Absalom continue to increase. It's a slow process. It's taken some time. But now it's kind of moving forward. It's getting some momentum now. And he's absolutely told this lie to his father uh, about going to Hebron to fulfill a vow that he made to the Lord. That's not why he's going. He's going there to rally people around him for his cause. He's going there to try to claim the, the crown of that little community there. So in verse 13, there was an informer that came to David and reported it. He said, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. And David said to all the servants with him in Jerusalem, get up, we have to flee, or we will not escape from Absalom. Leave quickly, or he will overtake us quickly, and heap disaster on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Boy, that sounds like a real warrior, doesn't it? Huh? That really sounds like the guy that took down Goliath. That really sounds like the guy that had so many great victories in battles where he was so outnumbered. The situation seemed totally impossible. And what always happened? God brought him through. You know, this kind of reminds me of Jezebel and Elijah when he had gone and done battle with all them false prophets on Mount Carmel. And then Jezebel heads out, and she's going to go get... And he's terrified of this woman. He's just won the greatest victory he could ever win against these false uh, gods and false prophets and these cults. But yet when this woman vows to come after him, he's terrified, and he runs away. Now, how in the world does that happen? How is it that David is such a war hero? He's so well known by everybody. Elijah's known for being such a powerful prophet, but yet these two men of God are running for their lives at this threat that they see. Was that the thing that David should have done? Is that the good way that David should have responded to what was going on? I think David should have said, All right, guys, get up. Let's get some guys. We're going to take care of business right now. And we're going to put it in a, nip it in the bud. We're going to get Absalom and silence him. 
and his followers. But no, David is scared to death of him. He's going to overtake us. He's going to heap disaster on us. And so verse 15, the king's servant said to the king, Whatever my lord the king decides, we are your servants. Really? Wow. Don't you think there's a time in our lives where we need somebody to come alongside of us and say, you know, maybe you ought to reconsider this. Maybe you ought to step back and pray about it for a little while. Maybe God will reveal something to you in this situation that I don't know if you're moving along in, in God's will or if you're moving in your own fear, but maybe we should step back a little bit and just and see what God wants us to do. I don't see that here at all. As a matter of fact, it would appear that David didn't even ask God anything about it. He just panicked. Come on, we've got to get out of here. Our lives are on the line because of my son and all of the wonderful things that he has planned for me. So the king's servants, instead of counseling, instead of encour encouraging him, <coughs> excuse me, instead of encouraging him, they just went along with it. That's a problem. You know, there's a time to follow somebody. There's a time to support somebody. But there's also a time that person needs to be held up. You know, I think of the, the battle that Moses was fighting against the Philistines. I believe it was the Philistines. And they were up on the side of a mountain. And Moses was sitting there with his arms raised up and the children of Israel were whooping them. They were winning the battle. And Moses' arms got a little bit weary. He lowered his arms down and the tide of the battle changed. And Israel started getting their, their selves beat up. And he'd raise his arms back up again and they'd start winning again. And then he was weary and he'd bring his arms down. So the people that were around him, unlike these guys around David, came to Moses and they said, you know what? If you can't hold your hands up, we'll hold them up for you. If you can't hold, on your, hold your arms up, we'll hold your arms up for you. We'll come alongside you, and we will support you. And they did. And because of what they did, Israel won a great victory that day. Unfortunately, there are many, many times today, as in this story we have here tonight, when people should be rallying around their leaders, when they should be rallying around their pastor, holding his arms up, they're not. And it winds up becoming a terrible thing. It winds up becoming defeat. So when you think, well, you know, I don't really have much of a, a purpose for being in the church, you know, I come and I sit in the cushy little pew once a week and you know i i'm not involved in anything but you know i'm here i'm paying my life insurance payment every week when i come um but i really don't want to get involved well that's a big problem in the church people not wanting to get involved and then you have other people who would say well i'm just going to have kind of a critical spirit and i'm just going to sit back and i'm going to try to find things that I can accuse people of. There's people like that in the church, too. <clears throat> and then there are those in the church who look at the leaders and they say, you know what, that's just a person just like me. We have the same weaknesses. We have the same flaws. We can all go down the same path if we're not careful. So that person needs us to hold his arms up at times, to support him at times when things are tough. Not to just say, well, whatever you think, Pastor. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, a rainbow flag in the sanctuary, nice colors and everything, and maybe we should just catch up with the times, you know. Oh, my goodness. 
Well, I don't know about having a rainbow flag. Oh, now you're closed-minded and you're this and you're all that and, you know, you're a bad guy. Let me tell you something, you guys. We need support. Okay? There's a pastor down the street here who has lost that. They didn't hold him up. Matter of fact, they threw him to the wolves. It was not a good thing. It was not godly how it was handled. And that church over there right now is in dire straits. That's why we want to be praying for them. We want to be praying that God would restore good leadership there. And we want to be praying that God would take the pastor there and comfort him. And I can tell you right now, just to clear the air, okay, because you may hear, nothing happened, okay? Nothing happened. Now, there were some feelings that were inappropriate. There were some thoughts and some emotions that were inappropriate. And so if a person has these inappropriate emotions going on and they think, you know what, God, I've been fasting and praying and you're telling me you've got to get this taken care of. So I'm going to go get it taken care of. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to go to the people and I'm going to tell them. I'm going to confess. And I'm going to tell them that I need their support. I need them to raise, hold me up. And so you go and you confess. But nobody wants to hear that. All they want to do is just condemn you. All they want to do is put you up against the firing squad. Put you in a kangaroo court. Have meetings when you're not present. Taboo, right? Just not fair. So we got a guy who's given his whole life to serving the Lord. And now, within a couple of days, it's all gone. My heart breaks for him and for the church. So, I'm saying all of these things just to try to draw to our attention that while we see what's happening here in the Scripture, we need to see it when it starts happening among us. Gossip. Chit-chat. Inappropriate speech, holding grudges against people, power plays, all of those things. Those things happen in church? <laughs> yeah, they do. Even in the best churches. Except this one. <laughs> we don't have any of those problems. <clears throat> as far as I know. So the king's servant said, okay, whatever you want, Dave. Let's just do whatever you want. So the king sets out in verse 16, and he takes his entire household. They follow him, but he left behind ten concubines to take care of the place, the palace. And so the king sets out, and all the people followed him. They stopped at the last house, while all of his servants marched past him. And all the Kirathites and the Pelathites and the people of Gath and 600 men who came with him from there marched past the king. And the king said to Atai of Gath, Why are you also going with us? Go back and stay with the new king, since you're both a foreigner and an exile from your homeland. Besides, you only arrived yesterday, and should I make you wander around with us today? Well, I go wherever I can. So go back and take your brothers with you and may the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. So this fellow, Atai, evidently was kind of new on the scene, but he saw what was happening and he kind of wanted to support the king. So, you know, this procession's leaving Jerusalem and as they're going out of town, um, all these people are watching this happen and here's this guy and they said, to David said, hey, dude, go on back into town. Live your life. You don't need to be caught up in this. You're new around here. There's no reason, you know, for you to get caught up in it. But in response to Tali, uh, verse 21, he vowed to the king, As the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king is, 
whether it means life or death, your servant will be there. Boom. There you go. There's a good guy to have around right there, right? No matter what, man, I got your back. So march on, David replied to Atai. So Atai of Gath marched past with all of his men and the dependents that were with him. Everyone in the countryside was weeping loudly while all the people were marching out of the city. As the king was crossing the Kidron Valley, all the people were marching past on the road that leads to the wilderness. Wow, I like the way that's worded right there. They're on the road that leads to the wilderness. They have no clue what lies ahead of them. So Zadok was also there, and all the Levites with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set the Ark of God down, and Abathur offered sacrifices until the people had finished marching past. And then the king instructed Zadok, Return the Ark of God to the city. If I find favor with the Lord, he will bring me back and allow me to see both it and its dwelling place. However, if he should say, I do not delight in you, then here I am. He can do with me whatever pleases him. So the king said to the priest Zadok, Look, return to the city in peace, you and your two sons with you, your son Ahimaz and Abathar's son Jonathan. Remember, I'll wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem, and they stayed there. So he's kind of sending them back to kind of keep an eye on things, maybe to update him on any new uh, developments that might be happening, uh, to keep him up to snuff, right? So David, in verse 30, David's climbing up the slope of the Mount of Olives. Interesting. The Mount of Olives. Does that sound like a familiar place? The Mount of Olives. It just shows you how long that, gar that grove had been there. We really don't know how long it had been there at this point in time, but we know who prayed there one day, huh? We know it was Jesus that went to the Mount of Olives with his disciples. The very same place. This is very interesting because he also crossed over the, book of, the brook of Kidron on his way out of Jerusalem with his disciples as they went up to the Mount of Olives. And so we see this happening like eight, nine hundred years or whatever before Jesus even on the scene. David's actually doing a rehearsal of what Jesus is going to do. It's amazing. He's going up the slope of the Mount of Olives and he's weeping as he ascended. And his head was covered. And he was walking barefoot. And all the people with him were covering their heads and they went up weeping as they ascended. And then someone reported to David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Lord, David pleaded, Please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And when David came to the summit where he used to worship God, Hushai, the archite, was there to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. And David said, If you go away with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and tell Absalom, I will be your servant, your majesty, Previously I was your father's servant, but now I will be your servant. Then you can counteract Ahithophel's counsel for me. Won't the priests Zadok and Abathar be there with you? Report everything you hear from the palace to the priests Zadok and Abathar. And take note, their two sons are there with them. Zadok's son Ahimaz and Abathar's son Jonathan. Send them to tell me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's personal advisor, entered Jerusalem just as Absalom was entering the city. So David is trying to insert these people into the palace 
to pay attention to what's going on, what their plots and their plans might be. And Ahithophel has turned his back on David, and he's going to be giving bad counsel. Now, when we were praying tonight, and I hear this prayed quite often when we're having our prayer time, Lord, we pray, let these evil people who make these terrible decisions... Let their plan turn into foolishness. Let their counsel turn into foolishness. And we pray that because that's what we want to see happening. And David's doing the exact same thing here. He said, Lord, let the counsel of Ahithophel become foolishness in the people's ears. We prayed about that tonight. For our state and for our government in our state, here, in Oregon. Because you know what? We got a bunch of fools running this state. <laughs> hey, okay, so, eh, he said fool. Well, the Bible said the fool has said in his heart that there's no God. We don't need God. We're going to make up our own rules. We're, gonna, we're going to promote our agenda and just push God further and further out of people's lives. And we pray, Lord, let their counsel turn into stupidity, foolishness. I pray judgment would come down on these people. And I'm going to clue you in right now, it will. Okay? We might not see it, but it will. Believe me. He is not missing a thing. Okay? We're living in times right now unlike any other time in history. There's been a lot of wicked things happen over history in a lot of different countries to a lot of different people. But what we're looking at right here, right now, is we're looking at the end times unfolding right before our very eyes. Where wickedness appears to be more powerful than good. And the even one step further. They're saying that wickedness is good. And they're saying that goodness is wickedness. You know, Paul warned us clear over in the book of Acts when he said, hey, there's going to be these guys that are going to creep in among you after I'm gone. And they're going to bring in every damnable heresy you can possibly imagine. They're going to come in to destroy the bride of Christ. It's, it's in there. It's over and over and over again. He, he, he warns Tim, Pastor Timothy of these things happening um, because Timothy was a young pastor. And, you know, um, listen to this. He says uh, in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, he says, Now the Spirit explicitly says in latter times, that some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through hypocrisy of liars whose conscience is seared. They will forbid marriage. They will demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received by those who believe and know the truth. He's talking about these men who are false prophets coming in um, to the people. And over in the book of Acts, he mentions it too in his farewell. And I know i got to wrap this up, you guys. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, in his farewell to the people, because he's getting ready to go to Rome, and he knows that when he gets to Rome, he's never going to see him again. This will be the last time he ever sees these people that he loves so much. But he's given them a warning. And he wants them to know that these people are going to, as soon as I'm gone, they're going to creep in. As soon as I'm gone, they're going to try to get at you. And sure enough, just as he said, it did. It did happen. So, Again, the tactics are the same. The faces are different. The times are different. 
Um, but the agenda is still the same, right? To destroy God, to destroy our children, um, to take everything that we find to be precious and pollute it. And this is what he said to the people. He says, I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. So be on guard for yourselves. This is a message for us. So be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as an overseer to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up, even from your own number, and distort the truth, and lure disciples into following them. Therefore, be on alert. Remember that night and day for three years I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. So this is very serious business here. This is his last words. He's getting ready to get on a ship. And after he said this, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there were many tears shed by everyone, and they embraced Paul and they kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. Hard stuff, right? Um, these are the things that you and I are being called to be on the lookout for today. They look like us. They do. They can speak Christianese pretty good. They know that. Right? They can fool us. But again, I think we talked about this last Sunday. There's going to come a time when that crop is fully grown and it's going to get ready to be harvested. And there's going to be a very clear difference between the ones that bear no fruit and the ones that have borne fruit. So what is our call? Our call is to bear fruit. Our call is to keep paying attention to what's going on. To commit ourselves to God and to God's grace. And you know what, you guys? He's going to bless us continually, right? So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I just love, Lord, how we can read this. And we can find application for our time right now. That we can see, Lord, that, <laughs> that your plan is unfolding right before our very eyes. Lord, I want to pray for anybody tonight. Anybody listening online or in this room that might be going through fear, uncertainty, doubt, confusion, I just want to pray for them, Lord, that, that you, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just gently nudge, woo them back into your arms, Lord. You draw us with your great love, and we want to be there safe with you. But there are those, Lord, who are floundering. They're weak. So we want to pray for them tonight, too. Pray, God, you'd bless our church. Bless the people in it. Bless your word as it continues to go out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.